Good afternoon. My name is Gerrit Tron and I work as a geologist for Datamine Software in our Johannesburg office. In this webinar, we are going to use Strat3D to create a structural model of a typical layered igneous deposit. South Africa is well endowed with tabular metalliferous deposits, ranging from chrome and platinum in the Bushveld complex to iron and manganese in the Northern Cape, and even gold in the Witts Basin. We have successfully implemented Strat3D at all of these deposit types, although today's webinar will use real-world data from a Bushveld deposit, the application in other deposits will be more or less the same. We are going to create a new project and we will focus on creating structural wireframes and block models only. You are welcome to join me tomorrow for a session in advanced estimation, where we will look at grade estimation in detail. Strat3D has the traditional estimate process built in it, if you want to do estimation. To create a model, we are going to use boreal data, underground mapping data, and survey pegs to model specific reef horizons. I'm also going to introduce you to a script, which will make the manipulation of the model very easy. If you have any questions, you are welcome to ask them after I have completed the demonstra demonstration. Alternatively, you can email me di directly after the meeting. Thank you for your time and it's a privilege to have you as my guest this afternoon. Before we enter Strat3D, let me introduce you to the data we are going to use. On the screen, you can see our baseline data. We have boreal tables in CSV format, but you can link directly to a table or a view in your database using an ODBC connection. We have a wireframe of an igneous dike. The wireframe is closed and has been verified in Strat3D. Remember, an easy way to create a wireframe in Datamine is to use extrude strings, with the shortcut EXS. Then we have some fault strings. They are already in data in the data mine format, but you could have uh, they could have been in any other CAD or common uh, file types. We also have a boundary string, and, um, and we also have some strings indicating the position of potholes in our reef. We also have a topography wireframe, and then we have strings of our mapping data and points of the pegs. I will show you during the webinar how we are going to format the data so it can be incorporated into our structural model. I'm now going to switch my screen and then we're going to continue with Strat3D. Creating a new project and importing data. We click on Strat3D in the upper left corner and click choose new. I want to create my project inside an existing folder, so I'm just browsing to the folder that exists already. The project is called Strat3D Webinar. So I'm just browsing to it. You could have created a new folder as well, and I'm saying OK. It now creates a project with the same name, Strat3D Webinar. We can see on the left a list of tasks. Input, structure, quality, watchability, evaluation, reporting. Strat3D was built as a process-driven platform and therefore the simplified interface. One shouldn't let this fool you as most of the standard data mine tools can be accessed too. The first main task is input drillers. This is where we bring in our boreal tables. These, these survey the borals and do some valid, validation tests. So let's start with that. First, what I'm going to import is my colors. In this example, we've got CSVs, but as I mentioned, you could, could directly link to your database via ODBC connection. So I'm going to choose colors, import. As it's a CSV, I choose text, tables, and say OK. I go to my data, colors, open, do the mapping. In this case, all my data is in the correct format. And I say finish. I make sure that my data is correctly mapped. 
then I can, can say, okay. I'm going to do the same with my download surveys. Text I will import. Download surveys. And remember to make sure that you choose the correct uh, direction of your tip. Lithologies, import text tables. All those map columns are mapped correctly. And then strata create. You could you could populate your strata column or table from a, a column in your lithology file, but I'm, I've got a separate table with all my brief intersections in. So I'm going to say text tables. I'm going to data, strata, open. Next, next, finish. Okay. Once I've loaded all my tables, I can click on validate and build drill holes. What this will do is it will desurvey the, the portals and create 3D portals of my data. You see, I've got some warnings under my lithology and strata table, and we can now go and see what those warnings are. You will also get a summary of your portals in this window down here, which says uh, if there were any errors or gaps or anything wrong. So let's go and view the tables. Here's my four tables. I'm going to go first to the left table to see what those warnings are. And to, to jump between the validation errors, we can use these two validation arrows. So I'm just going to jump there. So there's an overlap in that portal, a gap from there to there, small gap, same story, small overlap and a gap. And you can use those arrows to jump between overlaps. You'll have to fi fix those uh, errors in the original data. And then um, you can either just refresh the table or you can re-import it. So the next task is to define the strata that we wish to model. So we click on input, strata. If we want to import all the, or model all the strata that's defined in our model tables, we can simply say, from holes. Yes, and that will populate or import all the strata that we imported in our strata table. We're going to say this card changes in this instance, as we want to only model a specific strata. You'll, you'll notice that Strat3D uses the terms sequence and strata. A sequence is simply a group of strata or a formation that's split from each other by discontinuities. A strata is a specific unit inside a sequence. Okay, so let's define our sequences. We can have three sequences. Is an older sequence for the UGT, a younger sequence for the Marinsky, and then an even younger sequence for a dolerite dike that intruded into the Bushveld complex at a later stage. So let's quickly define our sequences. So we say right click, new sequence. Right click, new sequence. We can then rename our sequences. So the bottom one will be, we're going to rename it, we're going to call it UG2S. We're going to give it an age, one being the oldest. We can see under conformity, we can also have different options. It can either be conformable, onlapping, erode or transgressive. Conformable will mean they will follow the same trend. Onlapping will typically be where younger strata were deposited on top of older strata. A typical example or classic example will be the 
the grew sediments that were deposited on top of pre karoo uh, topographies, such as the Dwaika, um, and these old paleo uh, topographies. Then we've got erode. Erode will simply erode all the strata. And then transgressive will be things like dikes or soils that intruded all the strata afterwards. So we're going to leave the PG2 as conformable. And we're going to leave it as the oldest strata that we are going to model or sequence. The next one is the Marinsky. We're going to call that simply MERS. We're going to give it an age of 2. And we can change the color of the sequence, although the sequence color is not really that critical. Then lastly, we've got our doll tolerite sequence. We're going to make that 3. And that conformity will then be transgressive, as it's a dike that cut through the all the strata. Our topography is right at the top, so no strata will be modeled above our topo topography. If we have a surface file, we can apply a surface file. That's typically handy if you've got underground boreholes or you've got a pit with boreholes that were drilled uh, in the original topography. But in our example, we have an existing file. Alternatively, Strat3D would have created a topography by using the colors of the borehole. So let's specify the topography file which is the triangle file in datamine format. So topo tr, you just pointed to the topo tr and say so open. Okay, so those are our three sequences. Next thing that we want to do is we want to define the strata inside each sequence. In the UG2, we have three strata. The UG2 itself, the hanging wall and the foot wall. That's what we want to model for this exercise. So we right click, we say add strata, add strata, add strata. To create our three strata. So we've got in the middle, we've got our UG2. Above it, we've got our hanging wall. And uh, at the bottom, we've got the foot wall. So strat 3D will never or will always remember these sequence or order in which we specify the strata and the sequences. You will never get strata that cut through uh, overlay, overlying strata and um, the validation is all based on these specific order of the strata that you specify here. Okay, so we can see there's a couple of options in the strata. We can quickly go through them. First one is the color. Obviously, if you want to change the color, you can do that. Um, you can change the name. So this name is what the code that's captured in the Boral data as well. Then uh, we can choose if it's burden or if it's reef or all. We're going to say that it is burden, hanging wall, and it will get a hatching like that. Then we can specify the continuity. So it can, it can either pinch halfway, sort of halfway between the borals. It can be continuous, which we rarely use, or it can be zero if it want if we wanted to pinch right at the borals. Okay, so I'm going to make mine zero. We can specify minimum, maximum thickness. We can specify an associated envelope. We'll look at that when we look at the dike. We can specify the conformity of the specific strata. So there we've got three options. It can either be conformable contiguous or non-conformable. Okay, so conformable, meaning again it will follow the same trend as the strata overlying it. Contiguous will mean there is no parting between that and the strata directly below it. You see what happened, there's no strata. So even if the borals, if you, even if the wireframes move away from the borals, there will never be a gap between UG2 hanging wall and the UG2 reef. Okay, so I'm going to leave it as contiguous. Um, we can also specify the, the subselling in the Z. 
So this is very handy for thick deposits like uh, manganese deposits um, or uh, certain coal deposits where you can specify the number of subcells in the Z. It can either be a, a number, a fixed number, so it doesn't matter how thick the reef is, it will always have a specific number of subcells, or you can specify a specific thickness of the subcells. And then you can specify must, it, must the subcelling start from the roof or must it start from the floor? And you can specify a minimum subcell thickness too. Okay, we're not going to do subcelling in the Z, but uh, it is it is there and it's very useful for thick deposits. So we're happy with uh, our hang wall. Let's quickly specify our, our Marinsky. Again, we're going to say this is a zero, and we're going to say it's contiguous. And the foot wall, we're going to also say zero, and we're going to make it burden as well. Okay, so these are UG2 sequence ready. Now we're quickly going to do the Marinsky. I'm going to quickly do the Marinsky, so we're going to add three strata in there. We're going to make all of them contiguous. Okay. So this is obviously a once-off during the creation of the project. It stores the settings inside the project file. So you can copy and paste that into a new project if you want to. Um, if you don't want to repeat this process during the next model that you create. Okay, I'm going to make all of this to zero. And let's set this also to uh, the annual and the football as waste. Okay. So those are our two main reefs with their footwalls. The next one is our dike. So we're going to go in there. We're going to say add strata. We're going to call this a uh, dike. Let's call it dike. Then, because it's a, a near vertical a body that we want to model, we've created the wireframe before before the time. There's two little portal intersections for Strat 3D to create the dike wireframe on its own. If it was a sill, we could have asked Strat 3D to, to, cre to create the wireframe for us, implicitly. Uh, we've, we've created very complex intrusions with lots of splitting um, and you can you have you are welcome to contact me if that's the sort of deposit that you have but uh, for this we're just going to use a, a simple vertical near vertical dike so we're going to just browse to that wireframe and that's where we use the associated envelope so let's click on that and we go and look for our dike wireframe just to quickly show you what it looks like Preview. So there is the dikes, two dikes that cut through our project area. And we're going to say open. Okay, and our topography already defined. So that's defining the strata. We can then save changes. The next tasks are faults and correlation of oh, qualities. We will return to these later, but first let's jump to correlation. In the correlation task, we can draw fence diagrams of our borals. We can correct data, we can correct incorrectly locked borals, we can help to use the tool to help us with sampling, and it's just generally a very nice tool to go and make sure that the data is correct. We can also use it for interpretation of faults and dolerite salts and the correlation of difficult to correlate strata. When we're in the correlation task, the first thing we do is we go and select the borals we want to put in our fence diagrams. So let's just switch off this grid in the background. Let's select these borals. Okay. You can then save that list for reference, so you can come back to it later. 
and then we click on depth correction and correlation. We can then see all our borals that we selected in a sort of a strip block format. Let's switch off our task control bar for now so that our screen is a little bit bigger. And I'm also going to hide the sheets control bar on the right. Okay, these strip blocks are completely customizable. So we can format them, change the way the data is displayed, change what data we see, and change things like legends um, and all sorts of labeling issue things. So completely formatable. You can see we can add data, we can format it, we can change the way that the holes are, the, the, the format of the data, and we can add any of the tables we loaded in the initial part of the importing. Let's just close this. Okay. We can, if we hold in shift, we can move all the holes up and down. If we leave shift, we can move one hole up and down. We can align the borders to a specific stratum. So if I zoom in and I want to align all of them to UG2, I just double click on UG2, and all my holes are now aligned to UG2, which makes interpretation easy. We can immediately see this hole doesn't have any footfall in it. So let's say we want to add a football in this section in this portal. All we do is we click on the football on the left and we go and click on the portal. You will see it snaps to the lithology interval. We can do the same with that portal and so on and so forth. We can also immediately see these big thickness intersection differences between adjacent portals, which might raise a few questions, but for this webinar, we're not going to go into that much detail. So we can see all our borals now have hanging wall, UG2, and foot wall, as we expect. We can then go up and we want to go and look at the Marinsky Reef. So let's align our borals to elevation. If we want to align our borals to elevation, we simply double click in the elevation column. All our borals are now aligned to the collar elevation, which makes it easy to see. We've got a reef that dips down, and we can uh, even see the distances between the borals at the bottom of the screen. So we want to make sure that our Marinsky correlation is, is accurate, so let's zoom in. And let's align all our borals to the Marinsky Reef. And we can zoom right in. Okay. So in this portal, I can see, although I've got a foot wall and a hanging wall, my Marinsky Reef is probably locked as a potholed reef. I just want to change that to. Um, to Marinsky. So I'm going to click on Marinsky. I'm going to change that interval. It's very thin so I can zoom in over here and just change that to Marinsky. And then I can zoom out a little bit. So let's align everything to Marinsky. Okay, this hole doesn't have anything in it, so we can just drag it down to see what's got wrong with it. Oh, it's way zoomed way out, so let's just get all of it and drag it down. Let's just zoom in here and see why this ball doesn't have any Marinsky reef in it. Okay, so we can see in the in the lithology column, we can see this uh, intersection of dike. So there's probably a dolerite dike intersection so that's probably what's replaced the Marinsky reef so if it's a, a transgressive dike we want the software to model the Marinsky right up until it intersects the dike so for, 
we are going to make this part of the hole. We're going to add a model flag to it that we call not logged. So let's do that. There's already one in, but I just want to show you how you would do it. We just select the part of the hole that you want to classify as not logged. So that will tell the software to ignore that part of the bottle and it will basically model the Marinsky Reef through the bottle based on the surrounding bottles. Okay. Our dollarite wireframe that we created will probably cut through that part of the bottle. So the, the wireframes created by Strat3 will, will run up until it intersects the dollarite wireframes. Okay, uh, let's just zoom in here. There's also a portal drift. Let's make that also. Uh, we just rename it to Marinsky. Very thin. Just for the sake of this exercise. Okay. If once we're happy, we can say save changes. Let's just go through it again. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, then lastly, what you can do in the correlation tool, if I just align everything to uh, elevation again, I'm just going to change the scale again so we can see everything. Okay. Okay, so there is our fence diagram. If we want to scale it according to the bottle spacing, we can hit space bar. And this, the bottles will now be scaled based on their distances apart. We can see that one is 824 meters apart, those two bottles, and those ones are 450 meters apart, so they are a little bit closer. If you hold in shift and roll your mouse wheel, you can change this horizontal scale. And if you hold in control and roll your mouse wheel, you can change the vertical scale. You can then also create a printout of your fence diagram. This is now on portrait, so it might be better to put it on landscape. And you can print that um, fence diagram out. Okay. Any changes that you've made in the strata using the correlation tool, will be recorded in a log file with the date and the time of the changes that was made. It will also not change the original data, but will create a copy of the data. So it's easy to revert back to the original data. They should obviously be taken care not to overwrite any work that you've done in the correlation task. Um, but that is uh, easily doable. Okay, so we can then save our changes and go back to the drill hole selection. I'm now happy with my correlation. I'm going to switch on my task toolbar again. And I'm now going to go to sections. Okay, sections is the next task. And it, you can use sections to create defined, predefined uh, sections. So if I want to create some sections, I can just click section by one point, for example. I can snap to a bottle. I can say I want a north-south section. I say, OK. I say done. Uh, it creates a section with its details. I can go and uh, edit those clipping distances. I can go and change it. I can add some parallel sections to it. If I want uh, five parallel sections, um, let's make them 100 meters apart, and I want uh, five sections, I can do that, and it will generate five sections parallel to that original section. Okay, so I don't typically use this a lot. I prefer to use uh, create sections on the fly, but you can predef create predefined sections if you want to. Okay. The next task, we can see these are different sections. The next task is expressions. So let's click on expressions. Okay, 
Expressions allow us to query the data, to run some formulas on our data, and it even allows us to write some newly calculated fields to our data. I'm not going to go into too much detail. We can see from, from the uh, command bar calculator there, you can build fairly comprehensive co expressions. Let's just quickly create a simple expression to look at the thickness of uh, UG2. So let me delete that old one. So I'm going to click on new. And I can rename my expression to something that I will remember. Let's call it thickness UG2. I can give it a description. Over here, I can type in my expression. You'll see there's a list of predefined expressions that you can choose. So I'm going to simply click on thickness. I'm going to choose the strata I want to calculate the thickness for, UG2. And I'm going to close the bracket. And then I'm going to say validate. Expression is valid, and then save changes. Okay, we could have done calculations such as um, if you wanted to calculate the, the interburden thickness between Marinsky and UG2, you could have said something like new thickness, let's call it uh, mid um, UG2 Marinsky. We could have said uh, the, the floor of the Marinsky. So it will take the floor elevation minus the roof elevation of the UG2. And that will calculate the, the thickness of the material between the Marinsky and the UG2. OK, save changes. So you can build complex expressions here. Um, then uh, if we want to go and look at our expressions, you will see there is analysis under input. There's also analysis under structure and these analysis under quality. So the first analysis will apply these expressions to our model data. The second analysis under structure will apply to the block model. And the last one under quality will apply it to our estimated block model. So let's just look at our block model, our model data for now. So we go to analysis. We can then pick our expression, let's say thickness UG2. We validate it. It will give us the minimum and maximum thickness of UG2. It will give us some statistics, the mean statistic. So the mean thickness is about one and a half meters. It gives us the standard deviation and the variance. Um, then we can quickly create a histogram if we want to of the thickness. And these uh, charts are customizable and you can format them, and change the way that they are displayed. Um, we can uh, create contours of our expression and we can write the expression to our data. So if I click on this, add column based on expression, it will write that expression to my Borel table. So very handy if you want to calculate things and write them to our data. Okay, that brings us to the end of analysis and expressions. And we're now going to move over to structure modeling. So we're going to create our model for now. Our, our wireframes and our block model. So structure modeling has got a couple of tabs. The prototype, parameters, interpolators, and additional files. Let's quickly run through what each of them do, does. So prototype is where you define your model prototype, your, your extent of your model, the size of your grid or the size of your blocks. Uh, you can specify subselling if you require subselling, minimum Z cell size. You can rotate your model as well if you want. The next tab is parameters. Yeah, it's uh, some some modeling parameters that you can set. Once you become more comf comfortable with the software, we will start using these uh, these parameters. Um, for the moment, we're just going to use the default ones, but there is a couple of options here. A nice um, function that I think I should mention is the, the fault transform and the lo locate stratum thickness on 0, 1 transform. That uh, is just uh, to help you to model things uh, better. Um, 
we've used this in a couple of the manganese projects, where it basically transformed the thickness of your reef to a one. So all the holes have a thickness of one, even if the thickness is, uh, is, is different. And that makes the correlation or the estimation much better. Okay, so if I've got a, a zero one transformed reef, the estimation is very, very good. Then we go to interpolators. Here we've got a couple of different interpolators that we can use to interpolate the thickness and the th values and the flaws of the reefs. Then under additional files, this is quite a, a, a comprehensive, although it looks simple, a comprehensive uh, tab. There we've got constraints, limits, exclusion lists, surveys, and a nullify list. Okay. So I think I'm going to quickly run this model. And then I will discuss what each of these additional files do. So let's quickly just say run. Okay, so a constraint file is used to manip manipulate boreal data. So we can tell the software to change the elevation of a specific strata in a boreal, for instance, or the thickness. Mapping and interpretation data is part of my uh, survey data. That is things like underground mapping, surface mapping, um, interpre interpreted uh, reef intersections, so sort of strings and points that you want to use as additional modeling points. Then exclusion list is simply a list of holes that we want to exclude from our modeling for some specific reason. We'll, we'll look at all these files in a moment. Um, then a, serve, a, a survey file we just spoke about. The limits file is the limits of our, of our boundary, of our model. So for example, our farm boundary or our mining right boundary. And then the nullify list is if you want to exclude certain strata in specific portals for some reason, you can apply a nullify list. Okay, we are going to create each of these additional files we are going to create in the script. So we will cover that in a moment and we will use those additional files just to add additional information to our model and not to just use the the portal file. Okay, our model is finished. Let's quickly build the strata model as well, the block model. Okay, so we've created wireframes and block models of our data, and we are now going to quickly look at it before we move on to the script. So we click on the visualization task. So let's just minimize these tasks. So it's a bit easier for you to see. So I'm going to click on visualization. So visualization is where we go and look at the data. What, where is all the wireframes that we just built, the block models, etc., etc. Okay. So let's switch off this this section. I'm just going to rotate my screen a little bit. So first thing is drill holes, then faults, strata, strata model, and references. Drill holes is basically for the uh, formatting of the drill hole, the way the portals are displayed. So we can say uh, we want to see the cylinder of the stratum. We want to make it a little bit thicker, let's say three or five. Fly. And we can zoom in there and we can see now the strata of the portals are shown there. Okay. We can also do uh, some queries. So we can uh, query our data here. So we can say include all the borals and we can say contains any expression. So we want to see all the borals that has um, Marensky in it. So we say contains any and we click on the strata over here. And we say apply. So we can see those are the borals that contains Marensky leaf. If we click on exclude, it will exclude all the holes that contains Marinsky. Let's say that, apply, so those holes don't have any Marinsky leaf in them. Similarly, we can do um, 
all sorts of other filters on our data. We could also write expression on thicknesses and things like that to show us which borders have a cutoff, below cutoff thickness, etc. etc. We can also apply a wildcard so if we want to see all the borders um, that uh, are in the tens, we can do something like this star, we say apply, and it will show us portal ID. Let's see, uh, that didn't work as I expected. Let's do that. Portal ID apply. It's an include, sorry, include. So it will show us all the portals that has BHID 5 as a start in them. Okay. We can also show just one bottle if we wanted to. Or we can show a couple of bottles if we want to use a comma. Okay. So that's just some basic bottle filtering and bottle uh, formatting that you can do in here. The next one is the fold tab. We don't have any folds yet. We're going to do that later. Strata sequence is what I want to show you now. Here we can switch on the wireframes. I want to quickly look at the wireframes we just created. So I'm going to click on uh, the UGT roof. And I also want to see the roof contours. So I'm going to click on those two wireframes and strings. So the model creates wireframes, created wireframes, and it created strings. So let's just quickly format that strings so we don't see the symbols. Which looks a little bit better. So that is the wireframe that we created of our UG2 strata. Okay, we can see this portal doesn't have any UG2 in it. Um, for some reason. And we can see there is probably faulting or something that causes that uh, dip in the strata. Okay, so we can basically switch on all our wireframes and uh, contours that we created during the model run. We can switch it on here. You can also create a, a default or 3D template visualization. So if I want to save, save this as a, a, a template, I'm going to say, uh, let's call it UG2 roof, where it jumps to that one I created earlier. Excuse me. Let me just uh, okay. So that's a that's a template I created earlier. Let me just uh, quickly switch on this uh, switch of these strings. You can also load in references, reference data. So if I want to show the portals, I click on this uh, this data mine format. So you can import data from different formats. I'm going to quickly load my. Uh, Bottles, for instance, let's just say all data mine files, bottles. Okay. Switch of these strings. And there is some, uh, let's switch of the strata. There is some bottle strings that I can display as well. Okay, you'll notice there is some quick tool buttons up here. If I want to switch off strata or references very quickly, I can do it here as well. I'm now going to show you how to use the script to create some of those additional files we talked about earlier. We're going to go to CAD tools to lo load the script. Let's go to CAD tools. CAD tools is the environment where you can edit strings, create new wireframes, and do sorts of all sorts of editing uh, tasks. We can see the standard data mine string tools are here, as well as other handy tasks such as project strings, translate strings, copy strings, edit attributes, uh, move strings. And all sorts of all of the data, standard data mine string files. Under wireframes, we also have some standard wireframe tools, all the wireframe linking tools, interactive DTM creation, 
create volumes, plan operations, etc. So we have some mapping data that we want to incorporate into our model. So we're going to quickly load those mapping strings. Let's quickly load them. Load data from external sources, data mine strings. They're already in data mine format, so we can just say OK. It's under data. I'm just going to choose all data mine files. UG2 map open. So those are strings. If I just zoom in, let me apply a template that I've created for them. Apply template. So those are little strings that represent the roof intersections of the UG2 reef as the geologists physically map them underground. Okay, so we want to we want to ask our ball our our wireframes to follow those intersections with the border intersections as well. So we're going to use the script to quickly add it to our model. So we're going to go to customize. There's our script. If we quickly just uh, start at the top here. We can quickly display the bottles. We can display the bottles. We can display errors, bottles with errors. We can display the bottles that were excluded during modeling. We can display the constraint bottles and we can display the bottles that were in our exclusion list. If we click on display holes, it will load the bottles and color them by a predefined legend. We've got that legend. You can see it there. Green is healthy and red is errors. So we can see those two holes were excluded from our modeling. That hole was excluded because it was uh, it's got to the wrong depth direction. And that hole was excluded for some other reason. All the rest of the green holes were used in the model. Okay, so this is a very handy tool to see which holes were used and which holes weren't. So we want to add those pink strings. We want to add them to our model to be used in the modeling. So we're going to go to mapping, okay, mapping data. So we are going to choose the file that we want to apply. That's the mapping file, the, the map file that we are going to use in our model. We can specify the strata. So these are all the strata that's in our, in our holes. We want to apply. We want to say it's the UG2 strata, and we want to say is it the roof or the floor? It's the roof. Then we select all our. Let's just switch switch all these holes. We select all our strings. We go back to customization, and we say select strings and add to mapping file. We can click on that. That added all those strings to our mapping file. If we want to go and edit the mapping file, we can click on load map string file and it will load this, the mapping string file for us as well. Okay, so those are the, the mapping strings. And you can edit them here as well and delete some of them if you wanted to. Okay, so I'm just going to switch that off. So our, our mapping data has been added to our to our file. The next thing that we want to do is we want to add some interpretation strings. Okay, so interpretation strings would be strings that you interpret, not physically measured like mapping strings, but more interpretation of the modeler or the geologist. So let's just demonstrate this by quick by means of an example. Let's switch off the UG2 wireframe. So there's my wireframe and I'm going to switch on my holes again. So we can see in Bottle 50, uh, the software uh, pinched out the UG2 reef because it seems like it didn't intersect the reef. In fact, this bottle was drilled slightly short, but because it's so marginal, the, the software didn't know that it was drilled short. You will see up here these shortly drilled bottles where it modeled the reef below it. Um, because it was obviously, it was obvious that it, that those holes were drilled short. Okay, but in this instance, it was very close, so it pinched it out. So I want to actually tell the software to follow a little string 
that I interpret as the roof or the floor of this roof. So I'm going to just draw a section. Let's just go into plan view. And let's just little draw a little north-south section. Or let's even a section by two points along here. Vertical section. We say done. And there's our section. Okay. Just like in studio, you can move these sections around dynamically if you want to. But we just want to keep it. Let's move it slightly off the borders like that. We're going to clip it outside over here. Let's align ourselves to the section. I'm just going to switch it off so it's not so red. Okay. So say, for instance, we've got a string. We interpreted that the roof of the UG2 follows a certain string. Let's quickly draw the string that we want to create. You follow. So we draw the string. I'm just going to do it. A nice funny shaped string that I want the leaf to follow. Okay. I'm going to go back to customization and then I can say I want the UG2. So let's choose UG2 and I want that to be the roof. So I can choose the roof. Then I choose select the string and add to the interp interpretation string. So I'm going to click on that. That will then add that string to the list of interpreted strings. You will see it changes color. Okay. So if I just switch off my clipping, I've got an interpretation string over there. And the next time I run the model, the wireframe should follow that oddly shaped red string. You see, I've previously added the interpretation string up here as well. Okay, the next manipulation that we want to, might want to do is we want to add a constraint file. Constraint. So constraint is applies to a specific portal. So for this example, I'm going to tell it in portal 50, I want my UG2 to pass through a specific elevation that I specify. So I'm just going to draw a section by two points again between those two borals makes it just a little bit easier to view and I'm going to align myself to it so I want, let me just switch my wireframe into an intersection ok, I want the UG2 just to pass below that portal so I'm going to zoom in a little bit I'm going to go back to customization. I'm going to choose a constraint file. I'm going to choose the stratum. In this case, it's already UG2. I'm going to specify the roof or the floor. I'm going to first select the bottle. So I'm going to click the bottle. It's changed the ID to BHI50. Then there's a couple of constraints. It can be either equal to uh, larger than or smaller than. And I'm going to Pick the elevation where I want my UG2 roof to pass through in that portal. So I want it to just pass through this elevation over here. So you see it populates that 139 meters. Then I choose add. It says, is this correct? I'm going to say yes. And it added that to a constraint file. I can edit the constraint file if I click on this edit. It will open the the CSV, I'm just going to open it for you here, and uh, it will open the constraint file, and there is the constraint I just added. So I'm going to close this again. Okay. Then, lastly, is the exclusion list. Let me switch off this clipping. Okay. So, with the exclusion list, I can exclude certain holes for some specific reason. Okay, you can see I've excluded those two holes already. So, uh, if I wanted to exclude a uh, bottle 61, for example, as well, I basically just click on the hole, 
it will populate it over here. I can type in a comma, I hit comment, so I can test, and I can say add. It will say, give me a, is this correct? I say yes, okay, and it will add it to the exclusion list. Just to show it to you, I can click on edit. It will open the CSV again, and it shows me there is the hole that I excluded. We can see those two holes I previously excluded for some reason. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna include that hole, so I'm gonna say delete and save. But I don't want to exclude it. Okay, so now we've added mapping data to our model interpretation, a constraint, and the exclusion list. We can now go back to our workflow. And we can run our model again. So let's go to structure, modeling. And you can see those are the files which I just edited. And I can quickly run this model again. Okay, our models have run. We've added those uh, additional files to our model. Let's quickly go and have a look at what happened. We click on visualization. And we can immediately see the gap between BHI 50 is now gone because of the constraint we added. So we can see it passes now through that part of the part of the border which we assigned and uh, we can also see if we switch on our mapping data let me switch on our mapping data let me load it rather as a reference then it uh, will look a little bit better and we apply that template again Let's minimize this on the right. And we can see now that our wireframes now follow these mapping points as well. Right. That brings us to our next and final task which is adding faults to our model. So we're gonna quickly go back to the fault task up here. Remember that when you do a model, you can jump backwards and forwards between these tasks, um, but we uh, typically do the faults after we've run our first model. The reason is we want our fault, I'll show you now, we've gonna ask the software to calculate throws. We want them, the software to use the, both the borel data and the mapping data when calculating the throws. Okay, so we got, we have um, some existing data on string files that we can import. Alternatively, you could have drawn a new string file over here, and you could have used the contours to tell you where you suspect there are some faults. But let's import some existing data on files. So in our data, there is a fault file. So open, and it's just a da standard data mine string file. You will see there's uh, some, it, if we add some information on the fault, such as his name, the throws, dips, and things like that, we could have mapped it over here. But we don't have any of that data in our string file. So we can just say, okay. So it added our faults. Let's just switch off our wireframes. So we can see where they are. I'm going to switch off my references as well and my borders for now. Let's make this a bit smaller. So we've got some faults. And if we change our screen, we can see that they are automatically converted into wireframes. If we click on a specific fault over here, it will 
create a wireframe and highlight that specific fault. Down here, we get all the details of the fault, the era, in other words, the age of the fault. We see it's set to dollarite. So it will display all the strata that we have, all the sequences. So we can actually make it Marinsky. So that means it will display the Marinsky and the UG2, but not the younger dollarite. Okay, so we're going to do that for all our faults. So let's quickly select all of them. That makes it a little bit easier. I select all of them holding in shift, and then I change all of their age to Marinsky. And then I say save changes. The next um, thing that we can change is the extent. We can change the starts on stops on the relationships of the faults. So let's quickly do uh, one obvious one. We can see fault 6 will stop on fault 2. So let's quickly go there. And uh, let's uh, it will stop on fault 2. So let's do that. Stop on fault 2. We see now with starts on, excuse me, we will make that stop on. We can see now that the, that fault, the wireframe stops on F2. Uh, those two we'll do in a second example. Okay, but first let's calculate the throws of these faults. We can see at the moment they all have blank throws and blank dips. So let's quickly calculate their throws. We, can, we could have added it manually, but we are going to ask the software to calculate throws for us. So we're going to select all of them quickly. We're going to click on automatic displacement. And we're going to leave all the settings as default. And we're going to just click on the run. So the software will use the mapping data and the borel data. And it will calculate what the expected throws between on these faults are. So it will just take a moment. And there it's done. So it gives us some warnings about the about the start and the end of throws that will be reset to zero. But if we go back to our full details tab now, we will see that every vertex on that fault will have a different throw now calculated based on the mapping data and the borel data. Okay, so all of our faults will have specific throws on them. We can, uh, if we wanted to, we could uh, change the tip. So we can say that is, uh, let's make it uh, 75 degrees. And because the, the points are so close, it's difficult to see, but let's just apply that. And we can see now that our fault, that part of our fault has a dip. It's difficult to see now because they're so close together, but they, they, that part of the fault is now dipping at 75 degrees. I'm going to leave it at 90 degrees. We can make all our faults vertical. Okay, so let's quickly just assign those uh, throws. Uh, for fault five and fault three also stops on uh, stops on if fault on the main on that if so it stops on if and of fault three as well. Fault nine. And fault six stops on fault two. And fault two starts on fault one.
Okay, so you can see starts on stop sign relationships are easily set and it's visually visually easy to confirm that what they do is in fact what you told it to do. Um, let's save these changes. The next thing that you want to do is just to save time, I'm going to just delete one of my faults. I'm going to delete fault 8 and 9. We can select them and just, well, let's just delete fault 9. Delete. Yes. So that will delete fault 9. Okay. I'm now happy with my faults. We can now use these throws as an initial starting point. Sometimes you'll have to go and, and go back and, and change them and manually uh, change these uh, throws. But for now, we're just going to use these uh, calculated throws. So I'm going back to structure modeling and I'm quickly going to update my model. I'm going to run it again. Okay. Our model is run. Let's go back to visualization and look at the effect of the faults on our wireframes. Let's just switch on our strata and we go to strata sequence. Let's switch on our roof wireframes and we can switch on our roof fault. Apply. We can color this, change this color of these strings so they are easier to see. Apply. Okay. So there is the faults. I'm going to just switch off those symbols. Here is the faults with their displacement. I just zoom around like this. We'll see my wireframes are displaced by those faults. As expected. Okay, that, that concludes the webinar of Strat3D, a quick uh, overview. I think we went slightly over our time. But I appreciate your time and your uh, attention. And uh, please contact us if you require more information. Thank you. Bye.